Hello, and welcome back to We're Not So Different, a podcast about how things have always been kind of shitty. <laughs> My name is Luke Waters, and I am an amateur historian. And as always, I'm joined by Dr. Eleanor Yaniga, who is anything but. Today, we have an interview, and that means we uh, have no question... Uh, but we're going to make it up to you patrons by doing a mailbag episode next week uh, since we've skipped so many questions the past couple of months what with all the interviews and such. Uh, also voting on the next book club book between uh, the Decameron and the Name of the Rose ends on February 28th. If you haven't voted, I think the Name of the Rose is leading by a little bit right now. It's like 5248 or something like that. So, you mm. know, make your uh, name or voice heard or yep that's what it is i know i know voting <laughs> slogans yeah sort absolutely of. yeah absolutely yeah anyway uh if you want to be a patron or if you want me to stop doing these stupid plugs at the beginning of every episode then subscribe to the patreon so i won't have to do them anymore yeah, dear god yep anyway patreon.com slash wnsd pod uh bonus episodes all that jazz uh we got uh we just put one out uh, current events complaining about the respective leaders in our countries and uh yeah we got uh, the fourth episode on andor coming out next week anyway uh on to the show so um it's pretty abundantly clear that uh you know breaking news here a lot of aspects of modern life just keep getting consistently worse in so many ways sure mm -hmm. if you compare our current standards to say a peasant living in classical rome or medieval china things are exponentially better for us in almost every way the technological, political, social, cultural, and medical advancements that are key to our daily lives, hell to our very survival, are nothing short of jaw-dropping. At this very moment, you're probably listening to this via a handheld computer that is exponentially more powerful and has millions of times the storage space of the computers humans use to travel to the fucking moon. And it's also small enough to be carried in your pocket. Uh, you think that Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin could have saved 40 gigs of useless fucking memes onto the Apollo lander computer? <laughs> Absolutely no. fucking not. We had, not at all. <laughs> we had kilobytes. Actually, I think it might have just been uh, bytes. Uh, we have antibiotics and vaccines now that functionally eradicate diseases, illnesses, and various forms of cancer. And they've been the scourge of human life for 99.9% .9 of our existence. We have wonderfully engineered machine, intricate machines that assist us with daily tasks and alleviate some of the backbreaking labor necessary to our lives. And yet, and fucking yet, everything is still getting worse. Every new advancement, no matter how wondrous it is in a vacuum, is quickly privatized, commodified, repackaged, and sold back to us piecemeal at exorbitant rates. It is laden with needless features has planned obsolescence built in and is attached to a mindfulness app. Why the <laughs> fuck is this happening and how can we stop it? Have people always felt like this? Is this longing for a time when things weren't so goddamn hard just a form of nostalgia we use as a crutch? Why the hell do I keep getting ads for TVs if I just bought a TV? How could I possibly need multiples of those items at once? I'm not a restaurant. <laughs> Shouldn't someone come up with a catchy neologism we can use to describe how everything is constantly getting shittier? Well, I sure as fuck don't know, but uh, I'd love to find out. And that's why we have award-winning author, journalist, blogger, and coiner of the term in shittification, Corey Doctorow, on the show. Corey, how the hell are you? I'm really well. And you know, that introduction uh, also made me think about how much more powerful our computers are than the ones that Chinese peasants used in the Middle Ages. And um, yes, it's yeah, another it's way. True. Like, I <laughs> think that the, the just the little onboard processor in this uh, camera that I'm using to talk to you, it's like 12 Antikythera mechanisms, maybe 15. Like, you know, it's <laughs> it's pretty high tech. <laughs> <laughs> I, see, I see what you're doing there. I like it. Uh, Corey, before we get into the actual show, I... Um, need to know that uh somebody on our uh patreon discord they sent me uh before we, before we even scheduled this interview they were talking about it we we're talking about nostalgia and they said you mentioned it in this um interview you did with uh radio canada and it's in french and mm -hmm. uh, i don't speak french because you know i'm a uh, filthy american dog um and uh i click on it Oh god damn it! It won't it won't translate it now. I gotta it's remember like, it. And mail modification. Yes, yeah, it's just the modification of uh, of the yeah. internet or whatever. And I just like 
we God. had a lot of fun with that. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, basic Google Translate functions. Um, it's, oh, no, it's, see, it's, now we've got an actual, like, Francophone on the show. Oh, so no, 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 I am not a Francophone. I'm an Anglo-Canadian. Okay. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah, hey, hey, I you speak, might, hey, you As the, as the saying goes, I, I speak French como en vache espanol. Okay, brilliant. Uh, okay. Because okay. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm constantly getting sticks. Some might say from my own loved ones uh, for my terrible French pronunciations, and it's not my fault. Okay? Right. Like, right. I, I speak a lot of things where you pronounce all the letters. Right. For example. <laughs> right. Uh, where you don't have like emotional support letters just thrown in there like French people do. So you know what am I supposed what am I supposed to do? You yeah. Know, uh, with this, but you need you need those extra letters for the haughtiness, the built-in hall. Oh. <laughs> the 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 oh fuck what is what is the alan the, the, the alan terroir the, the yeah, je ne sais quoi <laughs> exactly yeah, like, um, yeah no sorry it's a, it, it's just a lot because i the the french were important in the middle ages and so it's always coming up and i can you know learn most of them through conversation but i read a lot of things right and then, mm -hmm. then you know i try to say them out loud and everyone's like ha. Oh, sucked in. You read that like it's spelled. No, shut up. So like yeah. in the, I want to say the early 2000s, there was a kind of meme that went around uh, about a uh, supposedly technical term called hyperlexic, which is mm. people who mm. learn to read really early. And one of the signs of it was um, mispronouncing words because you learned a lot of words from books rather than hearing them spoken and right. uh, also speaking in paragraphs. Uh, so like, like inserting punctuation into your dialogue, uh, is, is considered a characteristic of being hyperlexic. I don't know. Like there was, I, I haven't looked into it lately. I just had this very dim memory of, of what it was like when I heard about it. Uh, I think it, it came out of, there was a science fiction convention where this fan, I think it was Elise Matheson's sister, who's a famous linguist attended and afterwards said, you know, you and your friends have, um, an accent. And she said, well, what do you mean? And she said, well, there are characteristics of your speech that we associate with development, not with hmm. subsequent um, uh, acquisition that you share. And the conclusion was that this was some form of hyperlexia, that like the people who read a lot end up being science fiction fans and they all mispronounce words because they've only encountered them in type. And then they speak like they're doing written dialogue because that's where their best examples of, of speech have come from. I, I have no idea if it's true or not. It's a thing that kind of stuck in my mind, though. Hmm. I remember that term vaguely from when I was a kid. Like I, I remember like that term being thrown like a bu a buzzword being thrown around at some point. Yeah. Vaguely in my head, bouncing around back there with like memories of baby Jessica and the challenger exploding. <laughs> <laughs> That's but it's interesting to me, right? Because there's there is um okay, so there is a historical concept that we use uh, called emotional communities. Uh -huh. um, so, you know, this idea that like, especially, well, you know, obviously I think about it within a medieval context, but you'll have these individuals who are from these really highly specific communities that are literate. And we know a lot about them because we have letters that they wrote back and forth. So if you are from, you know, one of the really hyper wealthy echelons of society where you learn to read and write, you will write letters back and forth and you will have these kind of like emotional connections mm. that we know about and can study because you're in this incredibly rarefied place. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because now that's like, we use that to be nerds. And I think that's cool. <laughs> I like that. That's very good. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. But okay. Well, Corey, let's, let's actually get you on to talk about, uh, you know, what we, what we told you. Sure. Cause, Le, cause cause and Oui, we tricked you, what what we tricked you into talk, yeah. uh, into the show. We actually brought you on here to talk about. I was really hoping I would think of something funny before I got to the end of that sentence. I got <laughs> nothing, man. Um, you know what? Actually, I'm gonna the state of you. science fiction writing. I don't know. I'm I'm just kidding. Yeah, Eleanor, go ahead. I'm, I'm sure I'm gonna trick him into talking about all kinds of historical things because nice. Uh, so, uh, Corey, instantification. Can you give us a potted? Uh, definition of this like let's be historians let's define our terms sure so i i like to it, it's it's my theory about why platforms decay uh and why they're all decaying now and i liken the sort of theor theoretical framework to uh a way of understanding disease so there's a part of it that explains like what the symptoms are there's a part that explains what the mechanism is like what's happening and then there's a part that explains the epidemiology like why it's happening now 
So the the um, the the natural history, the symptoms are that platforms are first good to their users. They bring users in, they find a way to lock them in, and then they take back some of the value, increasing tranches of the value that those users enjoyed and give them to business customers. And then once those business customers are locked in, they take away the value from them as well and they allocate it to their shareholders. And you end up with a platform that everyone is locked into, but that the residual value remaining in is very uh, low, and yet people find themselves still using it. And then that uh, very brittle equilibrium often shatters because the difference between, oh, this place is so terrible, but I can't stop using it because it's important for one reason or another. And like, this place is too terrible, I'm leaving. It's really razor thin. So, you know, for a lot of people, Facebook just hits this tipping point where, you know, a, a privacy scandal or a whistleblower or a live stream mass shooting just makes the difference between Jesus Christ, why am I still here to Jesus Christ, I'm leaving, right? So that's the, that's the symptomology. The um, the mechanism, like the, the way by which this is accomplished, has something to do with the intrinsic nature of digital tools. Uh, digital tools are really flexible, and that means that it's really easy to change the way that the system works from second to second and moment to moment. And so a good example of this would be something like the way Uber drivers are kept locked into Uber. Uh, Uber drivers bucket themselves into two categories. One is pickers who are picky about what the, what rides they take, and the other is ants who take all the rides. And the Uber wage pricing algorithm does this thing, Vina Dubel calls it uh, algorithmic wage discrimination, where the choosier you are, the higher the fee that you're offered per mile is. But as you become less choosy, that number creeps down. But if you become more choosy, it, it tighters back up again and it goes up and down toggling with your willingness to take rides. But eventually it kind of wears you out and whatever else you were doing to, um, you know, as your side hustles that let you be choosy about Uber, eventually they fall away because Uber has, has hit you in enough times with convincing high dollar uh, uh, offers for your wages that you just like you throw all in on it and then your wages just go monotonically down to like su far sub uh, minimum wage. There's just some stats uh, on the Uber picture in Toronto and the wage is about $5.50 an hour in Toronto. Uh, actually, that's the proposed raise that Uber is going to give them because it's going to it's going to pay them 130 percent of the minimum wage while there's a rider in the car but because most of the time there's no rider in the car you just get nothing right and so that that averages out with the raise to five dollars and fifty cents an hour because of the number of drivers mm -hmm. on the road so that's that's the mechanism this this super flexible digital tool and then the epidemiology like why is it all happening now is that historically firms were constrained from using this digital flexibility to harm their users and their business customers the first line of constraint was competition. Um, companies that fear that you will take your business elsewhere will on average treat you better. And if they don't, you can go somewhere else. And sometimes that happens with sufficient uh, uh, quantity and, and fidelity that like the company that treats its users badly goes under. And so that's the first line of constraint. 40 years ago, we started to draw down competition enforcement. That was, you know, Reagan, Thatcher, Pinochet, Mulroney, Helmut Kohl, and so on, all these leaders bought into this this um, Chicago school theory called uh, consumer welfare that said that so long as prices went down in the short term, monopoly formation was efficient. If everybody buys everything at one store and they all buy the same thing, that just means that's the best store selling the best thing, not that anyone's cheating. And so you have this like drawing down of competition. And so you have a lessening of the um, uh, discipline exerted by competition, but there are also second and third order effects. So the second constraint is um, regulation, right? If the expected fine from harming someone is greater than the expected gains, you know, maybe there's some like time value of money stuff in there where like, I'm going to do something that's cheating now, I'll get a bonus and quit, and then the fine will come later, whatever, right? But if the expected fine is greater than the expected gains, on average, companies will not harm you. And if they do, they'll get punished. And one of the consequences of market concentration of monopolization is that it's a lot easier for companies to capture their regulators. If you remember like the Napster era, there were like a hundred tech companies fighting seven entertainment companies. The hundred tech companies were like 50 times larger than those entertainment companies in aggregate, but a hundred companies as a rabble and seven companies as a cartel. 
And so in Westminster and Brussels and DC and Ottawa, everywhere the, the entertainment companies went seeking relief in this like intersectoral fight, they got it because they had message discipline. Like the tech companies not only didn't have like one hymnal they sang from, they couldn't agree on like how to cater a meeting where they would talk about what that would be. And so now we have regulatory capture, and that means that firms can routinely violate our labor law, our privacy rights, our, our consumer rights, you know, whether that's Uber cheating their workers or Amazon has this $38 billion so-called advertising service. It's not advertising, it's payola. It's what it's it, you pay to go to the top of the search listings, which is why when you go to Amazon, the, the first result on average is the is 29% more expensive than the best deal on Amazon. Any of the first four on average is 25% more expensive than the best deal on Amazon. And on average, you have to go 17 places down in the search results to find the best deal on Amazon. So like if you went into a shop in the street and you said, give me your cheapest batteries and they sold you their most expensive batteries, that would be a thing that they could get fined for or shut down for. Amazon, Google, Facebook, they say, oh, we do it with an app. So it's not a violation of the law. Mm. And so a third order effect here is that the flexibility of digital cuts both ways. Historically, digital services that abuse their customers that weren't constrained by regulation or competition still had to face what we call self-help, say, which is like users buying third-party ink or installing an ad blocker because digital is so flexible that you can always write a program that unshittifies whatever has been shittified, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and um, one of the features of regulatory capture is not just that you can ignore the law, it's that you can direct the law at your competitors. And so the, the metastasizing of IP law has made it a crime increasingly to do this sort of thing. You know, making an alternative app store for iOS involves uh, decrypting the uh, iOS application, bypassing the boot locker. Under Article 6 of the Copyright Directive and Section 12 of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, that's a crime. I mean, in the U.S., it's a felony punishable by a five-year prison sentence and a $500,000 fine. So Jay Freeman Ooh. calls it felony contempt of business model. So these companies, they no longer have these moments where like everyone's sitting around the table and someone says, why don't we make the ads like 20% more obnoxious and get 2% more gains? Instead, you know, where someone would say, well, well, if we do that, 40% of our users install an ad blocker, we never get a dime from them again, and we lose money on, on balance. Now it's just like, why don't we make the ads 100% more obnoxious and get a 10% gain? Because like, what are they going to do? If you type, how do I block ads on an app into Google? The answer is you can't, right? It'd be a mm -hmm. felony to try. So that's the third constraint. And I'm getting to the end of this. The last constraint, the, uh, the epidemiology here, is workers. Mm -hmm. Because the way that you mobilize tech workers who had tons of bargaining power, but had low union density, was to tell them mm. that they were on a mission, right? To tell them the reason that they had these whimsical campuses full of like kombucha and massages and like egg freezing service was so that you could uh, work through every hour that God sent, work through your fertile years, um, deliver to your boss's arbitrary deadlines because you were serving the user. And so the kind of downside of this for employers is that when you turn to those workers and you say, hey, it's time to uh, enshittify that thing that you missed your grandmother's funeral for, they mm. experience a profound sense of moral injury. They refuse to do it and they can get a better job across the street if you try to make them do it. So now we have 260,000 tech worker layoffs last year. And the mm. answer to I refuse to do that because it would be a moral injury is don't let the door hit you in the ass on the way out and don't forget to turn in your badge. And so now this is the epidemiology. When you take away all the constraints that stop companies from using the flexibility of digital, then they are able to do more of that value shuffling where they lock uh, end users in after offering them a good deal, take some of that good deal back, give it to business customers, lock them in, take that value back, give it to their shareholders, and then keep running until the whole thing is a pile of shit. And that's the enshittification pandemic that we're living through now. Mm hmm. I, mean, I find this so interesting, right, as, as a concept, because in the first place, I think you've done a great job of diagnosing this thing, you know, that, that I think we all experience in in so many ways and on so many platforms, you know. Um, and, you know, indeed, I, I suppose, like, I've got a, a particular one that we experience here um, in the UK because of the double whammy of, you know, like... Uh, Thatcherism and then um, and then what we call austerity and the way that it's mm -hmm. kind of like played out with the NHS and then they tell mm -hmm. us the way they're going to solve the NHS is through apps tech and app. yeah so like literally if I want to see a, a GP so like you know the regular doctor the first doctor that you go to 
I have to use an app to do that now. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Guess what? It doesn't it doesn't really work. Yep. And I can't I have a real hard time seeing a doctor, you know, things like this. So you know, this is this is and it's kind of endemic to this thing because you know, governments can't accept that, you know, they played a role in this and they've really kind of bought this line that, oh yeah, tech, tech is going to be the way to save us all, which is just kind of like bonkers. But I find this interesting too, because it's, we see things like this kind of play out in the historical record all the time, right? So one of the first things that always springs to mind why I think about this uh, for me is of course, um, enclosure, right? Mm -hmm. Which is, you know, my answer to everything also, mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm such a boring Marxist, like well, I can't help it, but you know, you have kind of like this system where everyone's sort of locked in and, and you don't have a choice, right? You don't have a choice. You're a peasant. This is the land you're bored on. You know, you kind of have to go along with it. But, you know, there there are some upsides. Like there's the bit of land that you've been farming forever. Okay. Like, yeah, when you're, when you inherit it, you've got to pay a little bit of money to your Lord, but you can work it. And that's where you run your sheep out on the common and so on and so forth. And hey, you know, there's the community that you experience. And then, you know, one day you get told, oh, by the way, you know, the woods, yeah, you can't gather wood there anymore. And you, and you need to buy the wood now. It's like, what do you mean I need to buy the wood now? Woods are right there. I'm the one working, I'm the one who's doing all the woodwork. I'm the one doing all the cops. Yeah, well, you've got to do it, right? And then, you know, the you lose the common green and you don't have any common grazing pasture. And then, and then, and then, and then eventually they come and they take the actual land that you're working, right? And this is of course a horror story that is kind of like led to the rise of capitalism and you know pushing everyone into you know factories or completely displacing them and making this kind of like big mobile labor stock and i just kind of wonder how that's playing out now in terms of i, I mean i suppose that this is what we're seeing right with like the tech layoffs right is like this creation of I guess the, we're, we're kind of constantly being told that the one form of labor that matters is tech workers, right? Like, I mean, you see this all the time in the university system at the moment where they will just shut down degrees because we're constantly being told that people need to do quote unquote STEM degrees. When they say STEM degrees, they don't even mean STEM degrees because they don't mean you should do a maths degree, right? Uh -huh. Like they're, they're, they're like, don't do that. And also it's like, they do not mean do a biology degree, right? They mean do an engineering degree because the only sector that we actually have going is tech and so like a go be a computer a, a data engineer some kind of engineer so you know that's all a lie but you know at the same time then you see for example i think it's the university of west virginia is just doing like massive closures of a bunch of its programs including like yeah. all of its foreign languages and yeah. um they determined this using an algorithm by saying these like these aren't performing these modules aren't performing, and they are on the whole bringing money into the school right so it's like it you just see it everywhere, right? There, there's more and more of this kind of storytelling that we make about where I suppose the labor is going to come from or how that's going to answer things. And, but it's still just the same story over and over again, only we have these like depressing new hallmarks, I guess. <laughs> Does that make sense to you, I guess? Yeah, you know, I think that one way to talk about this and to put it into... I, I, he's not a Marxist, but but into like Piketty terms, is mm -hmm. that when the uh, pick your pick your tranche, the top decile, the top one percent, when the when the wealthy uh, achieve a certain command over the economy, um, they are able to direct the functioning of the economy in ways that are ultimately not good for them and not good for society. So you know, Piketty's got this little potted story that goes like what what starts world war one is the end of primogenitor which was precipitated by the uh, uh era of colonization where you could maintain dynastic fortunes by among all of the children of of a uh, you know a dynastic pater familius so all the sons get a new fortune and of course that only works so long as you have lands to conquer and then when you run out of lands to conquer You've, you're kind of three generations into this period. So like everybody alive has basically never had a, an adult conversation with anyone who's known any life, except the life where all of your sons get to inherit a fortune. None of them mm -hmm. have to go off and join the clergy or go to, go to war. They all get to be a lord. And uh, World War One is just like the, the fail sons, you know, the fourth generation fail sons of the age of colonization going, fuck no. 
right? Like we are not going to go back to primogenitor. We're going to mm. take someone else's colony. While you were talking, I, I got to thinking about the work of Michael Hudson. And I was, if you saw me Googling while you were talking, I was trying to look up which, <laughs> which, which emperor it was he was talking about. I couldn't find it, but uh, uh, Michael Hudson, you, I'm sure you're familiar with him. He's this uh, historian of debt, mostly studies the Bronze yeah. Age and particularly um, Jubilee, the practice of the periodic forgiveness of debt. And he has this story that says, like, um, if, if you imagine just kind of a super simple economy where you've got like farmers and they're most people and then you got everyone else. And if the farmers aren't producing, everyone dies. And so the farmers need to borrow money every year for their inputs. They need to pay for farmhands. They need to pay for fertilizer. They need to pay for seed. So they borrow money from a creditor class. And then even the best farmer in the world will eventually have like a drought, uh, a pestilence, a bad beat. And um, then they will have to roll over the debt rather than rather than service it, which means that next year they're going in with debt and it's more than they can pay off by bringing in a, even a bumper crop run that long enough and you end up with a class of hereditary creditors and a, her a class of hereditary debtors. And in the absence of Jubilee, eventually the creditors have so much claim over the productive capacity of society that basically the farmers stop growing food and they start growing ornamental plants for the creditors table. And then society mm -hmm. collapses. And he specifically talks about a Roman emperor who abolished Jubilee and whose society then collapsed. Uh, you know, within a, a, I forget what time span. That's what I was trying to look up and I can't find it here. Uh, <laughs> and, um, I, and, you know, I think just like one way to just think about this is that when people lack constraint, which is why, you know, I emphasize constraint so much in the account of enshittification, when people lack constraint, you have a system that works well, but fails badly. So long as they're wise and flawless, it's great, right? You know, the, the emperor king can walk in and say, you know, uh, the iMac won't have a fan in it, right? Or the, the power book <laughs> won't have a floppy drive. But like, they can also say like, uh, you can only install software that we take 30% commissions on, or, um, you know, you can only access the your medical care in this way, right? Like the the reason the, the framers of the constitution who were wildly imperfect elitists who had all kinds of problems, but the reason they were so obsessed with checks and balances is they 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 knew how good a wise king could be and they were suspicious of of what happens when the wise king had a lapse or was succeeded by a, an unwise king. And you know the the tendency of capital to accumulate which you could mm. like, you could just look at it from Hudson's little story, a little simplified toy model. But, you know, there are more complicated ways that economists talk about this, about this, that the tendency of capital to accumulate means that accountability dwindles in the absence of some countervailing force. And then you just end up with like, you know, uh, apocalypse now, right? You end up with the colonel in the jungle who was really good at being, a, you know, a war chief, but also has crawled up his own asshole and died and taken everyone with him. Mm hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think we're really in that kind of finding out period, right? It, it, yeah. It's interesting, too, because we still, I, there is still kind of this tendency, you know, we like to think of ourselves as, you know, enlightened or beyond, I suppose, the, these issues, you know, all, all, these are all things that kind of happened in the past under monarchies and these things. Um, and yet you see this real kind of desire on the part of a lot of people to believe in kind of like, the good emperor, the good king, you know, the, the, the way that people, you see weirdos talk about Elon Musk, for example, you know, mm -hmm. where they, there's this real desire for him to be this thing that they imagine and, and a savior and, and this person who's going to come save them, despite the fact that, you know, homie, you're hanging out on Twitter, the website he ruined, and you know it's worse. <laughs> and for some reason, you're like making weird computer generated pictures of him surrounded by a bunch of monster babies and some, you know, and I don't really know what to do with it. It's quite interesting to me, right? Because I spent all of my time reading what a bunch of dead people thought and, and did and, and thinking about the ways that they thought about the world, right? So, um, you know, and, and I have to accept that, you know, they, they do kind of think, oh, I don't know, the king's the king because he's ordained by God and these things happen. But there are limitations to that, right? Because... You know, whenever someone decides to roll the dice and see if they can grab the throne, then they're kind of calling that into question, right? Mm -hmm. But I, I do have to say, okay, well, yeah, I guess that this is just the way your world works. And then it just boggles my mind 
that it's the year of our Lord 2024. And there's still guys doing this. And yeah. I'm like, I, is this just a comfort in the face of, you know, the degrading circumstances that we have? Or, or what is it just a familiar story? Is this just kind of like, a I don't know, a, a track we've worn, a groove we've worn into society? So I, that is a really interesting question. I, I, I think that one way to understand it would be to look at its corollary, which is um, the conspiratorial belief in cabals which is like the mm. flip side, right? If all of the good flows from someone who is ordained to be good, then all of the bad flows from someone who's ordained to be bad. Both of them are a way of um, avoiding systemic accounts, right? Mm. Like a lot, you know, a lot of people think that the reason inshittification happened is that the heroic original leaders of these companies left. And then they were <laughs> supplanted by, you know, bloodless <laughs> bean counters who do uh, shareholder maximization. And, you know, like, First of all, Amazon started in shittifying long before Bezos left, but also Google's in shittification accelerated when the AI panic sent the original two Google boys back to the, the Googleplex to run Google again. Right. So, you know, the idea that it's the vision uh, or, or the lack of it, as opposed to the wider social circumstances uh, Naomi Klein's new book, The Doppelganger, she she mm. ha quotes someone, I forget whom, but she quotes someone who describes um, anti-Semitism as the socialism of fools. So socialism yeah. is this understanding of a, you know, systemic uh, machine that uh, moves uh, value and capital and power from the mass to the elite as a kind of self-perpetuating system where you can trade out the elites, but you get the same system. Then anti-Semitism mm. is just the belief that there's like, a hundred bad guys at Davos who've made this happen, right? And, uh, and, and you know, they're all either George Soros or on his payroll. And, mm -hmm. and um, you know, like, there's a, there's a way to look at that that says, you know, maybe there's some room for common ground, which is like, if you've already decided that uh, the elites don't have your back and that the system is rigged against you, maybe we can just like gently guide you away from these individualistic accounts into a systemic understanding. Um, mm -hmm. That's sort of where Klein comes down in the book. I, I wrote a column about this called The Swivel-Eyed Loons Have a Point, which was about the anti-locked, uh, anti-15 um, minute city demonstrations in Oxford, which are obviously mm -hmm. very unhinged, but like it's not unhinged to worry that CCTVs that are used to like recognize license plates and control traffic and do calming yeah. will end up suffering mission creep and be used in authoritarian ways. Right. It's not crazy not to think that digital currencies will be used to uh, punish people who are disfavored by the state. Right. Like all of the things that they're worried about are real. It's just that they understand them as a plot by a hundred guys in Davos who look like anti-Semitic caricatures from the Weimar era and not, like a system that exists to produce this outcome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, I, I find that quite an interesting one because you know, the, I suppose that what I always kind of say to is it always imagines them as more important in, in this kind of theoretical plot, you know, as, as a disenfranchised person, you know, they see through this kind sure. of thing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and they're the ones who kind of have this and, them being slightly inconvenienced because they have to drive a little bit further in order to go to the grocery store. That's like the great injustice, not, you know, the fact that police are, will probably use this plate recognition technology to like, you know, target black people. Cause that's what, that's what they use yeah. for, uh, you know, like everywhere. Right. So, but there's always this uh, imagined victimhood within that as well. So, I mean, it's, and certainly we do see this within well, like historical anti-Semitism as well. Right. So if we think about, for example, um, you know, medieval anti-Jewish panics and like blood libel things where it's like you find a dead kid and then you go, oh, Jewish people did a whole mm -hmm. disgusting black mass with him. And then you do a pogrom. Right. right? And, and and you burn everything down. And it allows the perpetrators here to say, well, I'm actually the victim here right. while victimizing another group. So it, it's a really interesting way of kind of enshrining yeah. victimhood. I I mean, as someone who's not a historian, even a pretend historian, <laughs> I I wonder about the social contingency or the historic contingency that upregulates or downregulates the salience of those views. So like, mm -hmm. you know, everyone's shitty Facebook uncle was a racist creep before 2016. But yeah. after 2016, the thing that became most central to their identity was that, 
right? It wasn't just that, like, mm. they were emboldened to speak about it. It was that the, the issue they cared about, you know, I, I, um, I, I, I like the trash future guys who say that, um, the curse of being a leftist is that you have object permanence. So like yeah. <laughs> I, I was, you know, my mom was a, was a uh, significant organizer in the fight for uh, women's right to abortion in Canada when I was growing up. And so I was around those fights. And I remember in the seventies and eighties when evangelicals thought that caring about abortion was morally suspect because it made you a crypto papist. Right. Like you were probably secretly a Catholic if you thought abortion Whoa. mattered. Right. So there are people alive today who've not only changed their view on this, but the salience of that view has become so central to their identity that literally they would vote for like I mean, the cliche is the man charged with 96 crimes and a convicted rapist. Right. Mm -hmm. But like also anyone else. Right. Like anyone because this thing went from being a thing that not only didn't they care about, but they thought the people who cared about it were probably a little fucked up to the only thing they care about. And so, I, I mean, the, the like you think about Nazi Germany uh, and the preceding Weimar era and the historic contingency of all of those moments. And, um, you know, you have the Versailles meetings after the war. You have the French and the and the English who are wanting to just uh like pauperize germany in reparations and you have yeah. wilson who's like well if we pauperize germany it will be uh vulnerable to demagogues who will prey on the fact that people who might be anti-semites or might be you know german chauvinists or whatever but for whom that's not the most important part of their identity and they get up every morning and they go like how do i make germany great again it'll make that that the biggest issue for them and make them vulnerable and then wilson gets the spanish flu and while he's down, the French and the English conclude the treaty and they put mm -hmm. demands on the Germans that exceed the ability of the German economy to pay it. And then you get Weimar hyperinflation. And so like we talk, you talked about austerity and I mm -hmm. wonder, you know, like I, I don't mean to say that racism isn't real and I don't mean to say that class matters more than race or any of those other things that leftists are, are accused of saying. I mean to say that the salience of racism, xenophobia, sexism, homophobia, and other feelings that might be just present in a stew among people, even good people, but also people who are kind of reactionaries, that that salience just goes up and up and up and up the more everything else gets worse and worse and worse and worse. You know, yeah. Naomi Wolf, like, goes crazy and becomes the world's biggest, like, Steve Bannon fan and turf right after she goes on the BBC to tout her new book. And the historian mm -hmm. who's on with her is like, you have a misunderstanding about what this key term means. Your entire book is wrong. Uh, and then her publisher pulps it and fires her and she's humiliated. And then in the wake of that becomes crazy lady, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, it, I, I totally think that you're onto something here. There is, you know, this scarcity that I think tips people over, uh, you know, when things are bad. And, you know, I suppose that's one of the things that that is quite interesting, right? Because in uh, from a historical standpoint, like in the medieval period, that don't take much, right? Because sure. stuff is bad. Because stuff is bad, right. you know, like I, I, I'm allowed to say it. No one else is. Well, I heard that no one then <laughs> bathed. I heard that nobody bathed yeah, exactly, then. Cause, so cause, you know, no one was bathing. And yeah. so it was all bad. And, uh, yeah. But, you know, it, it's when you're on that knife edge in um, yeah. a peasant economy, yeah. right? When you really are dependent on every single harvest working out. When there is a class of individuals who are just straight up like, oh, yes, hello, I'm here to take all of the money because I'm a lord. Right. right. And when you, when you don't have rights and you don't have any recourse to anything, and you, for the most part, you're just kind of like working all the time down on the farm. You know, it doesn't take that much to set you off. Sure. Uh, and 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 like get you to kind of like go against other people. And I think we're experiencing a bit more of that now. And granted, I think part of the issue here is also the tech, you know, because obviously, you know, for a lot of people, Luke and I are elder millennials. So, you know, we can remember when things were slightly better. But, you know, <laughs> when I talk to uh, like Gen Z people, Th their entire experience of their whole life is just things are getting worse things are mm -hmm. getting worse things are getting and you know i can remember being lied to sure right? but that that things were going to be good and then that just like not coming out but 
there i do think that there is this kind of exacerbation that also comes along with the technology with this because um you know there's some things that man just wasn't meant to know dude right <laughs> like within uh i think that how much we know how much information we have hmm. just generally is, is is somewhat overwhelming for humans and sometimes you know the medieval world where you kind of you know mostly know everybody and you, you information kind of comes along when it comes along that's a lot easier to get your head around than hmm. you know when i look into the square in my pocket that makes me sad because it shows me how many children are dying in gaza and i'm seeing how the sea levels are rising and i'm watching you know my entire government ignore that and uh elon musk just did, said something stupid and you know it's and i can't find the right nail polish that i want on amazon because it's 25 clicks down you know or whatever like sure. you, when you can't even get your goddamn treats right you know? i so i i have two thoughts about this so the first is about things getting worse and i think that platforms got worse before too there's a wonderful mm -hmm. cat valente essay called um uh stop talking to each other and start buying and start shopping about her experience mm -hmm. as a tween on Prodigy and about how one day she comes down and her dad's at the breakfast table and the headline on the Wall Street Journal is Prodigy CEO, stop talking to each other and start buying things. And she's like, I don't even like, how do I buy? I'm 13. How do I buy things yeah. on the internet? <laughs> right? Like everything in her life had gotten better because of Prodigy and now Prodigy was getting worse. And mm -hmm. I think the mm -hmm. difference between now and then is that it's easier to leave that like the firms, the regulatory capture that firms exert today make it much harder to write the interoperable tools that export your data or continue to send messages or do something else that allows you to go from one place to another. So, you know, I, um, at the end of Fiddler on the Roof, right, you have this this moment where the, the poor people of Anatevka are finally being kicked off their land and they're saying these like solemn goodbyes and they're all going to different places and you know they're never going to talk to each other again and it's mm -hmm. the answer to this question that's in the subtext of fiddler on the roof which is given that the cossacks ride through every 15 minutes and kick the shit out of these people why do they still live in anatevka and the answer is because if they go they they lose each other that they matter more to each other than the cossacks are uh, matter to them right the, the 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 pleasure is more important than the pain and um, the there has always been these ways to to go on mass from one place to another. You know, when when Facebook was courting MySpace users, they gave them a bot, and if you entered your login and password for MySpace into the bot, it would go and scrape your waiting messages several times a day at MySpace and put them in your Facebook inbox, a Facebook inbox. Oh wow! And you could reply to them, and it would push them back out again. So you didn't have to choose between the people that matter to you and Facebook. And everyone forgets this about Facebook, but Facebook's first pitch when they opened up to people beyond those with .edu addresses, American college kids, was um, we will never spy on you. Facebook was like, Rupert Murdoch spies on you with every hour God sends. We are the non-surveilling alternative to MySpace. But, you know, the pitch isn't, okay, we're the non-surveilling alternative to MySpace. Come and hang out and look at our better privacy policy while your friends mm -hmm. all hang out on MySpace. It was like, keep talking to your friends, but be more private, right? So, so this was like a very powerful tool. A company tried to do this to Facebook called Power Ventures. They made an alternative uh, client for Facebook. And Facebook destroyed them. And then more recently, a company tried to do this to Instagram, which is a company that Facebook acquired through an anti-competitive acquisition that would have been illegal until the Reagan administration. And they made this app called OG app. And it got your login and password for Instagram. And it logged in as you to Instagram. It grabbed everything in your queue, threw away all the ads, threw away all the suggestions, took the posts from your friends, reordered them in chronological and just showed them to you and sent no data to Instagram unless you specifically interacted with the post. So you liked it or commented on it. Unlike Instagram, mm -hmm. which is doing shit like monitoring the accelerometer on your phone to see whether you like stop walking and look when a, th when a thing comes up, oh. you know, monitoring how long the thing is on your screen, all this stuff that is just not explicit interaction where they're just gathering all this implicit, super creepy surveillance crap. And, and, you know, like Facebook destroyed them too. And they did it with Apple and Google's help. Apple and Google were convinced that their terms of service required them to remove any mobile app that violated the terms of service of anyone else 
which is batshit yeah. because you can't like sneeze without violating someone's terms of service, right? Like yeah, no doubt. Terms of ter- terms of service, you know, could be translated as like many many tackle, right? Like you know, abandon hope, all ye who enter here, right? Like you know, by being <laughs> dumb enough to use this service, you agree that I'm allowed to come over to your house and punch your grandmother and wear your underwear and make long distance calls and eat all the food in your fridge. Like we all violate terms of service all fucking day. But yeah. when Facebook calls Apple and Google answer because they are also part of this racket. So the reason it's not just that the services are getting worse, it's that they're getting worse and we can't leave, that the penalty for going is higher. The new market entrants can't give us the third party printer rank that lets us abandon our printers, uh, our printer manufacturers campaign to raise the price of ink to $10,000 a gallon and go to greener pastures. We just, it's just like throw away your printer or keep paying a premium for ink. There's no middle position, right? There's no bargain there. Uh, more than half of all internet users have installed an ad blocker on their browser and zero app users have installed an ad blocker because it's illegal. And so, because you have to reverse engineer it. And so like, there's just no, no, no way to like make the service better at the margin when it's getting worse. And there's no way to leave the service easier when it gets irredeemable. It's just, we're just stuck in there until like Anatevka, we either get kicked off or we get, um, we get to a breaking point and we go. Mm -hmm. Uh, The other thing about information, again, this is an area where I defer to you, but I have to assume that like, the amount of things that you care about holds steady. Uh, it's just that mm. they become like finer grained. Like you probably know a lot more about the lives of your neighbors and their dramas or about imaginary demons or about the livestock or something. I mean, I don't know anything yeah. about medieval people, but I assume that it's just like, there's just a constant level of stuff filling your brain. That you're not just sort of like sitting there slack jawed, looking at the, looking at the cow patties <laughs> going like, well, True. nothing much to do here, you know? Yeah, I mean, actually, these guys definitely have a, a really great grip, for example, on, like, art, it's, which is, sure. I, I think that I'm, I'm always really quite interested in. It's like the average medieval person can can look at religious art and they'll see 12 million things in it that you and I yeah. have to be trained to see, you know? And then they've got a real kind of subtle, subtle way of looking at that. And, yeah, and they gossip and they do this and they do that and they plan holidays i'm sure they there are thinking about a lot of varying things so I, I suppose that what it is is that i guess we've used information you know just to bring it back to what i was saying at the very beginning in, in as a way of kind of like broadening our theoretical communities right so it's like what we we've been able to do with tech is say okay well not my community is larger now so you feel all sure. these things for people who live in you know brazil or here or there because you, because you can talk to them right and and you can see these things and so it's kind of like a, and on the whole it's a thing i like about people yeah i like how we're weird little guys and we will form attachments and yeah. we will do these things but you know it's it just sucks because the things that allow us to be the most people you know these things that in theory can have like these really wonderful effects because of the way that platform capture has you know played out we lose them, right? right? You know, because there there is always this kind of money making thing in there that stops us from just uh being cool and hanging out, I guess. And I guess the one big difference now that you describe this is is uh, weak social ties. That there were probably a, we probably have a lot more weak social ties, you know, which include these ties that we have that are you know attenuated with people we know on the internet and people we have parasocial relations with. But whatever, yeah, if like. If there's like 100 people that live within walking distance of you that you'll see in any given month and maybe a couple of, you know, peddlers who you'll see three times a year, then, yeah, you don't have a lot of weak social ties, whereas we probably have a lot more weak social ties and a Mm -hmm. lot fewer strong ties. Yeah. Yeah, I guess that's true. You know, um, and and I I think that I've definitely think uh, about a lot, too, is how a lot of the time when I do have strong social ties, they'll be with people who are really far away. (laughs) And sometimes I'll be like, oh, you know, it's the the people actually that ironically, you know, a lot of my besties, I don't live on the same continent as, you know, and then uh, so you you lose that ability to kind of like go for pint with them or whatever, even though you might check in. Right. Yeah. I mean, this is interesting because you and I are both, uh, um, what uh i'm told we're not supposed to call expats anymore uh because mm-hmm. an expat is a white a white immigrant basically but yeah. um 
you know, I, I started in Toronto and then I moved to Central America and then San Francisco and then London and then back to LA and then London and LA and London and then I'm back in LA and I've stayed here long enough that I'm now uh, an American citizen as well as a British and Canadian citizen. And mm -hmm. um, my grandmother was a refugee. Uh, mm -hmm. My dad was a refugee. They came from, uh, my grandmother's a child soldier in the siege of Leningrad. And my dad was born in Azerbaijan when she and my grandfather deserted from the Red Army. And they made their mm -hmm. way west to Frankfurt. My aunt was born in a DP camp and then they came to Canada. And they ended up with a bunch of extremely strong ties in Canada because of all the other people who had similar stories. And there was mm -hmm. a kind of mutual aid network. So my grandparents had, they did league bowling and they had card nights and they had big dinners and they were parts of fraternal organizations and religious organizations. They had a lot of strong ties, real Robert Putnam stuff. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, even though their ties with their besties were quite attenuated, you know, like they, they had all these other people they'd left behind. You know, my grandfather didn't, he had nine brothers and he didn't see most of them for the rest of his life. And the ones that he did see, he saw three or four times in his whole life. Yeah. Right. Uh, but he maintained this connection. They wrote letters, they spoke on the phone and so on. And I um, am likewise uh, someone who's lived a lot of places. Many of the people I'm closest to live on other continents. I lived in London long enough that I have a real cohort of close friends in London. Uh, I also have a real cohort of close friends and colleagues in San Francisco because I work for the Electronic Frontier Foundation. They're headquartered there. I moved to London to be EFF's European director. Um, mm. But what I don't have is a big community of strong ties here in Los Angeles. I have a mm -hmm. small group of people who I'm very close to. We, we have dinner parties. We have them over. But not like my grandparents, right? Like I'm not seeing my friends in LA weekly, right? Like yeah. we are really like it's a a month where we have a, a social outing with friends is a big month. You know, um, if we do two, it's an extraordinary month. And so uh, it is quite odd. It's, it's, it, it does seem to be a novel form of social relation. The emigrant experience of isolation from the people you left behind, and, but also quite an isolated experience in the place that you live in now where you have something that's not quite a weak tie, but is a very uh, fragile or long distance tie with people in lots of places, but no, no, not a lot of people you see every day or every week who you're really socially close to. Yeah, yeah. Oh, God, the modern condition. Yeah. I'll tell you what, uh, how about that? How about how that? About that? <laughs> but at least we bathe, not like those medieval people. Yeah, not like those filthy, not like those, like those filthy people in the past. We got that. But well, okay. Before we let you go, Corey, I actually wanted to also talk to you about your new book because you're so you're some kind of gross person who works all the time and is really prolific. And you disgust me, uh, frankly. But uh, I understand you've got the the follow up to Red Team Blues. Is yeah, you've got uh, the the bezel. The is bezel. Out now. Dude, That's B E Z Z L E, not B E Z E L. Uh, like yeah, so, embezzle. Okay. I, which I love too. Yeah. So <laughs> tell, tell us uh, more sure. about the book, please. Yeah. I, so I write it as displacement activity for anxiety. So during lockdown, I wrote nine books. Uh, so this Whoa. is just one of the many, many books that has come out. And it's the follow-up to a book that came out last year called Red Team Blues. And Red Team Blues introduces this character, Martin Hench, who's a forensic accountant who works in Silicon Valley and Red Team Blues is his final adventure. Uh, I originally wrote it with the conceit that it'd be quite cool to write uh, a novel that was the last book in a long running beloved series without ever writing the series, like recording the last <laughs> episode of MASH without ever having done 11 seasons of MASH. I, I still, I would actually love to write that TV show. I think, I, I think a weekly TV show that was just the final episode of a notional TV show would be amazing. Um, <laughs> But uh, the um, the my agent liked it or my editor liked it so much that he bought three. And I realized that um, I was kind of I'd written myself into a corner because it was his last uh, uh, adventure. And then I realized, actually, this is even better, because if you tell the story out of order, there's no continuity problems because you're not foreshadowing, you're backshadowing. You're just taking the uh... stuff that you wrote in the character's future and inserting it into his past. And you get to look like a really premeditated motherfucker. So the, 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 <laughs> he is like kind of a a zealot of um, finance crime. Like he has been at every high tech scam and uh, the, the red team blues, his final adventure, he meets the final boss, which is cryptocurrency, the scam of all scams. But in the bezel, 
it's set in the Yahoo era when we we begin this period in which tech grows by acquiring other companies rather than making things so that you can never escape. You know, when when Mark Zuckerberg mm -hmm. got up at two in the morning and sent his CFO an email going like, I know you think I'm crazy to want to buy Instagram for all this money, but it's better to buy than to compete. And our users like Instagram better than they like Facebook. So we just have to give them nowhere to go. Right. So this is the beginning of the mm -hmm. shitification cycle. And um, Marty, this this, you know, kind of gregarious storytelling uh hard-boiled noir forensic accountant who's like a a, a hard-boiled cop you know hard-boiled detectives are like unlicensed cops who go to the places the cops can't go and ask questions the cops can't ask except really what they're doing is they're asking the questions the cops refuse to ask and going to places mm -hmm. the cops don't want to go because the cops don't care if the crime goes on he's discovering the same thing anyone who's read the panama papers has discovered the same thing these are not like really um difficult to understand scams they're just like they've got enough performative complexity that our tax authorities can go yeah it's fine that all these people are stealing all this money from us it's just too complicated mm -hmm. for us to figure it out so in the bezel he's he's in a, embroiled in this yahoo era and his best pal is a yahoo exec who unwisely sold his company to yahoo and is now trying to get out but has golden handcuffs and so he's taking every spare weekend he can get uh, in as a VP, taking the weekends that even the French VPs won't take. And he goes to Catalina Island uh, over and over again, where there's this party scene. Uh, Catalina is this crazy island off the coast of, of California that was owned by the Wrigley family. It's uh, as in Wrigley mm -hmm. Chewing Gum, but they also own the Cubs, which is why the Cubs work at a Wrigley Field. Mm -hmm. And the Cubs used to play there. Marilyn Monroe was a child bride there. The um, CIA was founded there. Uh, it's like they, they have the, the first movie theater built for talkies. They have the largest ballroom in America. And for 10 years, the most popular music program on the radio was a nationally syndicated program where a big band would play in that ballroom. It's no cars are allowed it's filled with golf courts and also there's a herd of bison descended from bison that were brought onto the island uh for a zane gray movie that escaped uh and so like <laughs> it's it's just it's it's a crazy place and so he likes to go there and he ends up embroiled with this scene that turns out to be the nexus of a hamburger themed ponzi scheme uh where um the uh the uh, Catalina bans all fast food restaurants and Catalinans are quite fetishistic about fast food. And so it turns out that the guy who runs this party scene, this real estate baron, has cooked up this Ponzi scheme just as like a game to see if he can control and then destroy the economy of the island just because he's a sadistic prick. And when they undo this, this guy recruits the corrupt Los Angeles sheriff's deputies to run them off the island because Los Angeles sheriff's deputies are actual gangsters. The worst gangs in L.A. are Los Angeles sheriff's deputies. They keep getting arrested yeah. for pit fighting prisoners, running drugs like you name it. L.A. sheriff's deputies have done it there. There's one L.A. sheriff's deputy gang that you can only be initiated into if you kill a man like they are actual no fooling fucking oh. gangsters. So they get they get run off the island. And in the and and that starts this other character uh, on the way to getting his first felony, which then turns into a second felony and finally a third. And this is in the year of California three strikes and he goes to prison uh, for life. And that's where the start story really gets started because it's really a story about prison tech. It's a story about how you have these grifters who are not just privatizing prisons, but privatizing prison services where they'll say to a prison system, Hey, tell you what, take away your library, take away your mailroom, take away parcel delivery, take away the phones, take away the take away the continuing ed we're going to give every prisoner a free tablet and then they're going to pay through the nose to access all of those services on their free tablet and this is really happening it accounts for hundreds of millions of dollars in grift of prisoners and their families and it's about marty and this guy on the inside who's being targeted by like uh neo-nazi gangs who are working for the prison management um uh basically busting this scam and that's the that's the real story it's this high stakes story about how prison privatization and technology have worked together to build this uh like financial empire run by private equity companies that are just destroying the lives of the most incarcerated people in the world it's a fun story and it's got it's got a great revenge plot and it's real fun Oh, I love this. And I uh, am very, very into anything that kind of talks about the privatization of prisons uh, in general. Yeah. And I really enjoyed Red Team Blue, so I'm really looking forward oh, to well, this. Oh, thank but, you. Uh, it's, uh, yeah. Like, for me, this shit catnip. 
<laughs> just like I'm like because also you know it all, the the great thing here is that it's the only good kind of uh, cop is of course uh, forensic accountants hot cops right hot <laughs> cops there's one kind I pretend that the cop in the village people was a forensic accountant sure that, sure yeah you know, tax inspector yeah yeah exactly that's right was, that that shit's hot yeah right yeah <laughs> damn skiffy yeah like the one people the one the one uh, kind of cop that that uh, billionaires really want to defund. <laughs> <laughs> exactly exactly so and that they know. genuinely fear uh, yeah for sure well and i'm going out on tour with it i'm going to uh i think it's like 18 cities and at a bunch of them the places i've been able to we're having prison reform organizations come and table and uh, they're going to get yes. platform beforehand it's going to be really good uh there's nice. a couple of really good dates coming up i'm going to do one in la with adam conover from adam ruins everything who's done a lot of good work on this and then in seattle uh my my co-host is neil stevenson which is going to be really fun Oh, fantastic. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the shout out to you to like all the people I know doing uh, prison reform work in uh, the Seattle area. Come on. Yeah. Come on through Columbia Legal Services. Let's see. Show up to Corey's book. So Damn much. right. But, yeah. Yeah. Look, well, Corey, um, if people want to get hold of your multiple excellent books or hear more from you, where can our wonderful listeners hear from you? So I write this daily newsletter called Pluralistic.net and every day it has links to everything. So if you go to Pluralistic.net, you'll find it. It's Creative Commons license, so you can reproduce it. It's also republished on Twitter as Twitter threads, on Mastodon's Mastodon threads, on Tumblr, on Medium. Uh, you can get my books everywhere. Books are sold. The exception is my audiobooks. Uh, Amazon won't carry my audiobooks because they don't have digital rights management. They're not locked to Amazon's platform. So you can take them yeah. with you and Amazon won't sell books unless they're locked to their platform forever. Not for nothing. Amazon also got caught last year doing a hundred million dollar wage theft of audiobook authors who can't take their business elsewhere because all the books they've already sold are locked to Amazon's platform forever. Uh, so yeah. those are sold everywhere except Amazon and iTunes, which is just a front for uh, um, Amazon for Audible. Um, and uh, I produced them myself. The, the uh, Bezel and Red Team Blues were read by Will Wheaton, who just crushed it. Did such a good job. Oh, amazing. Um, oh gosh, I, I need to do more audio books, actually, because they're good for walking around. Oh, yeah. And I and I do be walking around. Yeah. So that's, yeah. I, uh, I, I have a chronic pain thing and I swim every day and I have an underwater MP3 player and oh. I get through two box, books a month. We live across the street from a big public pool and I swim nice. every day and I get through two books a month that way. It's great. Hmm. That, now it's that cool. is, that's thinking, I gotta say. It's my life hack. Hell yeah. <laughs> rise and grind it just, it had develop chronic pain everywhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is, this is, hi, this is like life hacks for hyperlexics. Uh, yeah, read in the pool <laughs> learn how to pronounce words oh god yeah that's that is actually a, a really good point that would probably help me that could help me with my whole french thing yeah get more french audiobooks there you go honky yeah. honky honky yeah <laughs> that's me that's me <laughs> oh eleanor uh where can where can everyone find your work yeah you know um check out the blog going hyphen medieval.com spend a bunch of time translating a bunch of latin last week so you know do me a favor and read that that'd be nice um otherwise of course uh the ones of future sex is out wherever good books are sold um it's now in paperback so you know you don't have an excuse um and then otherwise you know i'm on the socials at going medieval i'm complaining usually about people using the term dark ages incorrectly that's that's it yeah. they should have been called the smelly ages because they didn't bathe that's right. The stank ages. Look, All right. Look, I'm not going to get into it again, but the dark ages is a really good name. I'm sorry. You're just, you can't compete with that branding. I don't it's know what to It's true. Tell you. There's nothing I can do. The dark ages, like when you say that, you're like, ah, oh, yeah, those people were fucking bumpkins. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you can find me uh, on the socials. My name there is Luke is amazing. Um, you can find my old show, People's History of the Old Republic. It's about Star Wars, uh, wherever you're listening to this. And uh, yeah, thank you again so much for listening, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.